So I don't know about you guys, but I can't make a living from photography. So I have a day job. And uh, one of the things that we do sometimes is to hire a new colleague. And uh, we call up HR and we say, hey, HR, have you got a person for us that can do A, B, and C? And then uh, HR, they chew on that information for a little while. And then they come back to us and say, you just described a unicorn. Like what? A unicorn? Yeah, a unicorn. What do you mean by that? Well, you can't find a person who can do A, B, and C. We can find someone who can do A. Maybe we can some find someone who can do B. And maybe someone who can do C. And we're very lucky. They can do a little bit of A and a little bit of B. But doing A, B, and C well, no chance. No chance at all. So that's how we have a little cozy conversation. I'm just thinking, reading Galen Rowell's book, The Inner Game of Outdoor Photography, that if you were to describe him from a competence point of view, I mean, Galen could be the dumbest son of a bee that ever walked the earth. I have no clue. So I really don't know him. But if you looked at what he can do, if you looked at his competences, he was a fantastic photographer. He writes really, really well. And then he's also a mountain climber. And that to me is a little bit of a unicorn. And that's actually the term HR uses when we call them and ask for someone who doesn't exist. They say, guys, you just described a unicorn. So I think competence wise, Galen was a bit of a unicorn and it dawned on me actually when I read the book, how he was a unique combination of competences. Because he both rides well, he shoots well, and he climbs well. Pretty seldom to find all three in one person. I don't know if you've been to Berlin and seen the famous Brandenburger Tor, the gate that separated East and West back in the days from the Second World War and some years forward. And uh, I was really looking forward to seeing that monument. So I had sort of pre-visualized it would be huge, it would be big, it would be five, ten stories high and la -di -da. And when I then saw it in real life, I realized it wasn't quite the case. I mean, it was a nice monument and it was worth the visit. Just dawned on me. It wasn't sort of living up to my expectations. I hadn't realized it would be so small. Even though it wasn't small, it was just like I made it bigger in my head than it actually is. The reason why I mentioned Brandenburger Tor is that uh, I want to show you the little mermaid. She's right over here. And uh, it's one of the Danish Copenhagen tourist attractions, I would think. And if you've seen a brochure or an ad for traveling to Copenhagen, it's the little mermaid you see. So I want to see if I can help you adjust your expectations to what you will meet in real life. So she's right over here. Yeah, so as per usual, there's lots of people around the Little Mermaid. And uh, let me just show you what it looks like. There she is. Right over there. A little, little figure here in metal. Of course, there's a lot of history related to her. She got her head chopped off. I think that was back in the 60s. And of course that became another story. But look at her. It isn't exactly a large person or a large statue that you're seeing here. It is just the little mermaid. So little is to be taken very literally. So I'm sorry, I have to stop right there. The thing is that the little mermaid, she is protected. So you're not allowed to show pictures of her in a commercial context. And as this channel is monetized, I can't show you images of her. You can find images over on my Instagram account because that account is, uh, I don't make any money on that one. 
but I can't upload images, for instance, to my Flickr account because uh, you can also buy the images over there. So that's not allowed. So I'm sorry. I would like to say though that I think as disappointed as you can be when you see how little the Little Mermaid actually is, I think the, the, the thing to remember here is that it's the story around her that's strong, that she sits there half human, half fish on a stone to get a glimpse of the man she has fallen in love with, right? And I think that is perhaps the point with the mermaid is that it's not so much her as it, of course it's also her, but it's also the story. And that perhaps brings us back to a little bit around storytelling in photography and how important that is. I think that's one thing we can learn from the little mermaid. So I'm out shooting film today and uh, as per usual, I've forgotten to take the lens hood off. That was better now. I'm shooting with the Nikon F100. A camera that I know Galen also used. And I have the 24mm 2.8. And that is a lens he certainly talked a lot about, or talks a lot about in the book, The Inner Game of Outdoor Photography. He was, I think today you would call him a weight weenie. He talks a lot about how to optimize your gear so that it weighs as little as possible. And uh, of course that has been super important for him being a hiker and a mountaineer and so on. So he, he actually doesn't shoot that much with the F100 even though he mentioned it a few times. He also shoots with uh, I think an F65, which is a smaller and a lighter camera than this one. Back in the days when I shot film, I think we are back 40 years or so, I had to advance the film manually with a, a little lever, you sort of you sort of turned that and then it advanced the film. Here, you can both hear the mirror flicking and you can hear the motor pulling the film forward, ready for the next shot. It's actually a quite nice sound, if you ask me. I have a lot of slide film images that uh, I got from my parents and my plan is to scan them. So I bought a scanner and I hope also that the fact that I have a scanner can help me keep the costs of shooting with film down. It is quite expensive, so if you're planning to dive into shooting with film, I would say study the costs before you do so. But I'm, I'm curious to understand if, if film really looks different or if it's just something they say. So I'll be really interested in seeing how this film develops and I'll come back to you in a later video about whether I can actually tell the difference between film and then digital. So to wrap this video, I want to show you an image my, my father shot. He was a sports pilot and he flew a, I think it was called the Piper Colt, a plane with the wings up high. And uh, he took a picture of the cockpit and uh, I will show you as I speak here what it looks like. And uh, that image is from 1983. So that's actually 40 years old. That's food for thought. And you can see there's plenty of dust on the image when you study it, even though I've done what I could to, to clean it as, as best as I could. But I think there is some character here or some something about the image that I really like. And I'm curious to understand if, uh, if black and white images, they are like that, they have something special or they don't. So stay tuned if you want to follow me on that journey into the, the film world. So Galen's book is really interesting to read and he writes so well. And uh, he talks a lot about pushing film, the ISO on a film. And uh, I wasn't aware of that you could do that with a film, but of course you can. I thought that was a thing of the digital world. And then he also talks, as I mentioned, a lot about weight and how to optimize your gear so that it's well protected and light. That's another theme that sort of comes back several times in the book. So I'm sorry I couldn't show you images of the Little Mermaid. I hope that uh, you have a chance to get to Copenhagen and see her for yourself. Um, yeah, I can't afford the fine if they choose to fine me for using her image in a commercial context. So 
I don't really have an option, so sorry about that. It would have been nice to show her. I think the Little Mermaid is as iconic for Copenhagen as the Empire State Building is for Manhattan or New York. So it is a little bit strange that you're not allowed, but I guess legislation is legislation. When it comes to Galen, I would just repeat my message from the previous videos. Get that book if you haven't got it already, especially if you can get a used copy for a few few dollars. Uh, it's really worth the read. It's well written, lots of beautiful images in it and lots of experience, lots of things to dive into. So get that book if you can. Uh, that would be my advice. But as always, happy shooting. Take care. Bye-bye.